So we've talked about end behaviors or tail behaviors of graphs with polynomials and briefly with the parent functions of the rational functions. We can now take a further look into how do we identify and figure out what those end behaviors are. Because on the original parent functions, those end behaviors, those tail behaviors, are just y is approaching zero on both the left and right hand side, but that's not always the case. So let's take a look at this function here. We have the table written out and we have a graph. And this table in particular, what it's doing is it's looking at as x gets very, very large, so as x approaches infinity, and also as x gets very, very negative as x approaches negative infinity. We want to identify what the tail or what the outputs are doing. So you can see when we start at 10, the output's about 0.636. And then when we increase that to 100 from 10, it's about 0.737 and so on. As we keep increasing, the amount that the y is changing by is getting smaller and smaller so that as x is getting bigger and bigger, the change in y is getting smaller and smaller. So it's getting closer and closer, but it doesn't want to actually get to that final value. And then it gets to a point where when you make x big enough, it's just so close that there's not enough decimals for rounding, so it just rounds up to 0.75. And so that's what the end behavior is. As x gets really big, that end behavior is 0 0.75, or the y values get close to 0.75. And then same thing with the negative values. We see that we have at negative 10, the output is 0.888 repeating. And then if we make the x negative 100 from negative 10, we get 0.76. So this is getting smaller. So notice that when we start with positive x values and we're getting bigger and bigger, the y values are getting bigger and bigger. So we started underneath the end value of 0.75. We started below it and then we got closer and closer. So we, we went from below to, to getting close from the bottom. And then on the negatives here, we're starting above that end value. So we can see that the end value is going to be 0 0.75. And so what that looks like here on the graph is that we have this horizontal asymptote at 0.75. And we can see the end behaviors here. So on the left hand side, when the x's are negative, we're above that horizontal asymptote. On the right hand side, when the x's are getting positive, we're below that 0.75. So this line here is y equals 0.75. And let's take a look at the next one. We have the same x values listed out here, just increasing by multiples of 10. And then on the other one, we're increasing or decreasing, making it more negative by multiples of 10. So as the x gets larger and larger and larger, we can see that the y values, what's happening to them is that they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. In particular, they're getting closer and closer to 2.5. And then on the other one here with the negatives, we start below 2.5, but you can see that as we get more and more negative or as we go to negative infinity, the y values get closer and closer to 2.5. So we can draw this on the graph as well. And we see we have at around 2.5 here, we have this horizontal asymptote, y equals 2.5. Five, and the graphs level off around that 2.5 as they go to positive and negative infinity. On this one, however, let's take a look at the tables. So we have same x values, start at 10, get very, very large by factors of 10. And the y values here are getting closer and closer to zero. And then on the other one, we start out with negative 10 as the x and then we get very large um, negative numbers or very negative numbers and the y values start at negative 0.13 and they get closer and closer to zero as well. And so what that means is that horizontal asymptote that's along the x axis. So that is a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. But notice here with this graph and It'll be easier to see if I give it a, a small little sketch here, just follow the graph along. This is what the graph looks like. And we can actually see here that with this graph, there are no vertical asymptotes. All the rational function graphs we've seen so far have all had vertical asymptotes. However, this one does not have a vertical asymptote. So you might be wondering, why is there no vertical asymptote here? Well, remember what we talked about 
with vertical asymptotes, they happen where the domain is undefined. Or in other words, they happen where the denominator is equal to zero. So what x values will make this denominator equal to zero? So if we set this denominator equal to zero, 2x squared plus 1 is equal to zero. I mean, really, it's not equal to zero. That's what we don't want. That's how we find the restrictions on x. That's how we find the vertical asymptotes. If we were to try to solve for this, let's say we want to get x by itself, subtract 1 on both sides, and then we have 2x squared is not equal to negative 1, and then divide by 2 to get x by itself, and we have x squared is not equal to negative 1 half. And then what we would do here is we would apply the square root to get x by itself, but then we'd apply the square root over here. However, this is not a real number. This will include imaginary numbers. And because they're is no real solution here. There's no real restrictions on x. So in actuality, this function here has no restrictions on the x, which means its domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity. And so because there are no restrictions on the x, that means that there are no vertical asymptotes because vertical asymptotes happen when we have restrictions on x. But because there's no real solution, there's no real number that will make this denominator zero, that means that we will have no vertical asymptote here. So we can say that the difference between this one and the other ones is that there is no vertical asymptote. And so you might be asking the question as well, how do we know what the horizontal asymptote is going to be? Because on this one here, the horizontal asymptote is zero. On this one here, the horizontal asymptote is 2.5. And then on the other one, it's 0.75. So the question is, how do we determine if we are just given the equation, how do we determine if that horizontal asymptote is zero, if it's 2.5, or sometimes it just doesn't exist? So let's make a quick rule of thumb uh, or guidelines for how to determine what the horizontal asymptotes are. So to determine the horizontal asymptotes, let's say we have a rational function, and the most important part of the rational function are the terms with the highest degree. So let's say we have a rational function where in the numerator we have a times x to the m plus dot 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 some stuff. It doesn't matter. We're assuming x to the m is the highest degree term divided by b times x to the n plus some other stuff. It doesn't matter what the other stuff is. We're only concerned with the highest degree term. So if this is our function, then what we have is a set of rules that we can follow to determine what the horizontal asymptote is. So in this case here, the thing that we're comparing are the degrees. So with the different degrees tells us what the horizontal asymptotes are. So we can look at this example here. In this function, we have the degree in the numerator is one and the degree in the denominator is two. So we have the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator. What happens then is that the horizontal asymptote is y is equal to zero. And that's because as x gets really big, the denominator is going to get larger much faster than the numerator is going to get much larger. So if you plug in 10 here, the denominator is going to be, is gonna end up getting larger and larger versus when we plug in 1000 or 1 million, the denominator is gonna get larger and larger quicker than the numerator is. So when you divide by a bigger number, your number gets smaller and smaller. Right? One half is bigger than one fourth, which is bigger than one eighth. So as the denominator, the thing you're dividing by gets bigger, you get closer and closer to zero. So this case here is that if n, the degree in the denominator, is greater than m, the degree in the numerator, then what we have is that the horizontal asymptote, I'll abbreviate that HA, the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. The other case is that if n is equal to m, so if the degree in the denominator is the same as the degree in the numerator, then what it ends up being, the horizontal asymptote, is that the horizontal asymptote ends up being the ratio of the coefficients of those largest degrees because the numerator and the denominator will get larger and larger at the same rate if the degrees are the same. 
And so if they're getting larger and larger at the same rate, then that means that we end up just getting the coefficients out front. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals a over b. And then the last case is that if the degree in the denominator is less than the degree in the numerator, then we will just say that the horizontal asymptote does not exist. Because if the degree in the numerator is larger, then that means the numerator will grow faster and faster. So there's no limiting or breaking off value in the denominator. Where like with the first one, it divides it to zero. And then in the second one, they sort of level off to be equal to each other. But then if the degree in the numerator is larger, then that means that the numerator is running unchecked. It's getting larger and larger. So this is the guideline that we want to follow. So let's take a look at a few examples and determine what the horizontal asymptotes are and determine what the vertical asymptotes are. So for the horizontal asymptotes, we need to compare the degrees in the numerator and the denominator. And we're only looking at the highest degrees. So on this first one here, we have the highest degree term is 5x to the 1. The next highest degree term in the denominator is 3x to the 1. So because the degrees are the same, this is both 1 and 1, the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the coefficients of those terms. So the horizontal asymptote here is y is equal to 5 over 3. That's all we have to do for the horizontal asymptote is just identify which degree is greater in the numerator versus in the denominator. And then for the vertical asymptote, we check to see what x value will make the denominator 0. A good surefire way of figuring this out is just setting the denominator equal to 0. So if we have 3x minus 4, if this is equal to 0, well, technically you say it's not equal to 0. We have 3x minus 4. We add 4 on both sides, so we have 3x is equal to 4. And then we divide by 3 on both sides to get x by itself, so we have x is equal to 4 divided by 3. And we would just write this as x equals rather than x is not equal to because we're writing it as the vertical asymptote. So we're writing it as that equation, what that vertical line is, rather than writing what the restrictions are. When we write the restrictions, we say x cannot be equal to 4 over 3. But because we're writing what the vertical asymptote is, we just say x is equal to 4 over 3. So then the next one here, we want to compare the highest degrees in the numerator and the denominator. So this one's actually flipped around a bit. The highest degree term here, or the highest degree in the numerator, is 1. So because we have x to the 1, and then the denominator is the same, it's x to the 1. So because the degree in the numerator and the degree in the denominator is the same, that horizontal asymptote is just the ratio between those coefficients. So that ratio is y is equal to negative 2 over 3. And that's what the horizontal asymptote is. And then the denominator here, we just set the denominator equal to 0. However, we already did this. It's the same denominator as the first one. So that vertical asymptote is just x equals 4 over 3. And then on the next one here, we compare the degree in the numerator to the degree in the denominator to determine what that horizontal asymptote is. And since the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator, 2 compared to 1, then that means that the horizontal asymptote is equal to 0. That's that first case here. The degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator, so y is equal to 0 is the horizontal asymptote. And then to find the Vertical asymptote, we set the denominator equal to 0, so we have 3x squared minus 3 is equal to 0. We want to get x by itself, so we add 3 on both sides, and then we have 3x squared is equal to 3, and then get 3 by itself again. We divide by 3 on both sides, and so we have x squared is equal to 1. And then we apply the square root, cancels out with the squared, we apply the square root, but we can always get plus or minus here. So what we have is that x is equal to positive 1 and x is equal to negative 1. These are the horizontal asymptotes on this one. A little bit more work that we had to do compared to some of the other ones, but it's just a few steps of algebra. Just get x by itself once we set the denominator equal to 0. So we have two vertical asymptotes here. And then on the next one, we have 8x squared plus 2 in the numerator, and in the denominator we have x cubed minus 1. So to determine the horizontal asymptote, we compare the degrees in the denominator and in the numerator. Since the degree in the denominator is 3, which is larger than the degree in the numerator, which is 2, that horizontal asymptote is just y equals 0. 
And then to get the vertical asymptote, we just set the denominator equal to zero. So we have x cubed minus one is equal to zero. And then we get x by itself. So we add one on both sides. And then we have x cubed is equal to one. And then to solve for x, we apply the cube root. And then that divides or cancels out. And then we have the cube root of one is just one. So this is x is equal to one. And just a side note, when we do that square root when we're solving, we can get two solutions, plus and minus. However, when we do the cube root, we can only get one solution. Because when we write a cube root that's asking the question, what number times itself three times will give you one? We can only get a positive solution here on the positive one because positive one times itself three times will give you positive one. However, negative one times itself three times would give you negative one. So negative one would not be a solution here. It's only positive one. So the vertical asymptote is x equals positive one. And then for the last one here, we have 4x cubed plus 5 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have 2x squared minus 1. So we first compare the degrees in the numerator and the denominator to determine the horizontal asymptote. On this one, the degree in the denominator is less than the degree in the numerator, 2 compared to 3. So what that means, that's the last case here. The degree in the denominator is less than the degree in the numerator. So we have that the horizontal asymptote does not exist. DNE does not exist. So to find the vertical asymptote, we set the denominator equal to 0, and then we solve for x. So we have 2x squared minus 1 is equal to 0. To solve for x, we add 1 on both sides. So we have 2x squared is equal to 1. And then we divide by 2 on both sides to get x by itself. And we have x squared is equal to 1 half. And then we apply the square root on both sides. So that cancels out with the squared. We apply the square root. Since it's a square root, we're putting that in there and we're solving. We can get two solutions plus and minus. And then what we have here is that we have x is equal to, it's going to be positive, negative. However, when we write the square root of 1 half, we can apply the square root to the numerator and we can apply the square root to the denominator. We can do that with square roots when it's multiplication and division, not addition and subtraction. So we apply the square root to the numerator. The square root of 1 is, well, just 1. So we have positive, negative, 1 in the numerator, and then square root 2 in the denominator. We can write this as two solutions, but for now we can just write plus minus, but it's really positive 1 over square root 2 and then negative 1 over square root 2 are the two vertical asymptotes. So now let's do a review of all of the different properties and how we find them of rational functions. So first with the vertical asymptotes, we set the denominator equal to zero, then solve for x. And then whatever the solutions we get there, that is the vertical asymptote. Remember to always write it as an equation, x equals blank. And the holes in the graph is when we try to simplify the ratio or by canceling factors. So we get this by simplifying the ratio or the rational function, which we get by canceling factors. The horizontal asymptote is where we compare the exponents. And to save us the writing, I'm just going to say see previous page because we just follow those rules and there's, there's just three different cases. Whether the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator versus less than the degree in the numerator versus they're the same degree in the denominator and numerator. So I'll just say see previous page for this one. Um, the x-intercepts, now with the x-intercepts, in general to find x-intercepts you make y be zero. So you set y equal to 0, or f of x equal to 0. So we just set the function equal to 0. But what we're really doing, and what we really all we have to do, is that we're just looking for the zeros of the numerator. So it's really just the zeros of the numerator. And we haven't really touched on this too much, but we can touch on it now, is that the zeros of 
the numerator. Because if we have a function, say, x squared minus 1 over x plus 2, if we set this equal to 0, to solve for x, what we would do is we would want to get rid of this denominator, or you want to get the x out of the denominator. So to get the x out of the denominator, we would multiply by x plus 2 on both sides. And then this divides out to 1 and 1. We'd have to do it to the other side to make sure we stay equal. So we multiply by x plus 2. So what we end up with here really is x squared minus 1 all divided by 1, which is just x squared minus 1. And that's equal to 0 times x plus 2. 0 times x plus 2 is just 0. So this is really what we're actually solving for. We're just looking for the zeros in the numerator. So really we just set the numerator equal to 0 is the approach that we can go by. And then for the y-intercepts, just like with any function, just like with the x-intercepts, we find x-intercepts and y-intercepts with any function the same way. For the x-intercepts, we set the y equal to 0. To find the y-intercepts, we set the x equal to 0. So we plug in 0 for x. So this is a nice review of all the different properties and uh, approaches that we can take for finding these properties of rational functions. So one situation that we could be given is where we could be given the functions and then have to identify some of the properties and knowing some of the properties, we can figure out what the graph or what the function should look like as an equation. So let's write out some of this information that we know here. So this first one, we can look at the parent function should be 1 over x. So that's the parent function because it has this general shape of this odd symmetry, right? This odd symmetry about the origin, or but the origin is shifted over. So they're in like opposite corners is the, the different pieces of the graph. So the parent function is 1 over x. The vertical asymptote, is x equals 3. So if the vertical asymptote is x equals 3, that tells me that in the denominator, x equals 3 is a 0, or is a solution of the denominator. So if x equals 3 is a 0 of the denominator, then that means that the factor of the denominator is x minus 3. This goes back to finding zeros of polynomials using that factor rule, where you say if you have the 0, the factor that goes with this zero is just x minus the zero. So we have that at the very least, what we're working with is x minus three. You can also think of it as this just a horizontal translation to the right by three. So we have part of the function here. The horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. So remember the horizontal asymptote is y equals to zero. If we scroll back up and look at the rules that we have, if the horizontal asymptote is y is equal to 0, that means that the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator. So since we don't have any other vertical asymptotes, we're just assuming that the only solution in the denominator is x equals 3. So that means that if there's only one real solution, we're just assuming that the denominator is degree 1. So what that means is that the numerator doesn't have an x in it because if the horizontal asymptote is y equals 0, then that means that the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator. So let's write this as denominator degree is greater than numerator degree. And so if the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator. Since the degree in the denominator is just 1, that means the degree in the numerator is going to be 0. So we don't have any x in the numerator. So because of this, that means that there is no x in numerator. And then the last thing that we can observe is that this is actually a reflection of the original parent function. So if we scroll all the way back up to the original parent functions, the original parent function of 1 over x looks like this, where you have the curve in the top right corner and you have the curve in the bottom left corner. And then in our picture, we have the curve in the top left and in the bottom right. So there's actually a vertical reflection happening here. So let's 
scroll back down and write that there is a vertical reflection on this function, which means that we have a negative out front. So there is also a vertical reflection which means that our function looks like this. We have f of x is equal to negative one over x minus three. So now let's take a, a look at the other one here. So we see how the general shape is, is that they're both shooting up to positive infinity. We have the curve is in the top left and, and the top right sections. So that means that this is the parent function of one over x squared. So we have that the parent is one over x squared. So let's identify some, some of the other properties that we have here. So we have that the vertical asymptote is x is equal to negative two. So that means that we have in the denominator x plus two as a factor. So what that looks like is that we have some stuff up top divided by x plus two in the denominator. And since the parent function is one over x squared, this would actually be x plus two squared. And since we don't have any other vertical asymptotes, we're just assuming this is the only zero or the only factor of the function itself. It's just x plus two squared. And now normally we would be able to use the x intercepts to determine what some of the factors or the zeros are in the numerator. However, we don't have any x intercepts. So we can actually assume that there is no solution or no zeros in the numerator, which means that either we have imaginary solutions in the numerator, or we have that there is no solutions in the numerator. So one way that we could work through this is that we now know that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals one. So if there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals one, then instead of thinking about this as comparing the degrees, we could also think about this in terms of transformations. Normally on the one over x squared function, the horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. However, we have it's at y equals one, so we can just do a shift up by one. So if we do a shift up by one, what that means is that we have this function here where we don't know what the stuff in the numerator is, and this is over x plus two squared. This is what we have from previously, just getting that the vertical asymptote is negative two. And we can just say you add one or shift this up by one. And so this is what our function looks like now, is some stuff in the numerator divided by x plus two all squared plus one on the outside. And that tells you that it's a vertical shift up by one. So then the last piece of information that we can use is that this y-intercept is zero two. So we have the point zero two on the function, or we have what the y-intercept is. So that means that if you plug in zero for x, you're gonna get two out for y. So the only part that's missing is what is in the numerator here. In the numerator, we can just assume that this is just some factor a. So instead of writing scribbly lines, we can call it some variable, some number a. So this number a, we can figure out by plugging in this point zero two for the x and the y and then solving a. So when we have that the point, actually slide this over a little bit so we have more space. So we have that the point zero two is a point on the function. So this is the x and this is the y, the zero and the two. So using this, we can plug that into the function and then solve for a. So we have a divided by, plug in zero for x, zero plus two, all squared plus one is equal to y, which we said is two. And then now we have an equation with just a as a variable. So let's solve for a. We can subtract one on both sides to try to get a by itself. So we have this is a divided by zero plus two is two squared is four. So we have a over four is equal to one. So then what we can do is we can multiply both sides of the equation by four to get a by itself. And we have that a is equal to four. So because we have a is equal to four, what that means is that the function 
let's write this up here. The function that we have is y is equal to, now we're taking this guy and just putting in the a that we found. So this is four over x plus two quantity squared plus one on the outside. And then you still might be asking, well, with the horizontal asymptote, how is it that the degree in the numerator, there is no x in the numerator, but the horizontal asymptote is one. So the degree in the numerator and denominator should be the same. And they actually are the same. If we have this plus one on the outside here, so I'm gonna box this answer because I think this is good enough, but we can go further and say that the degree in the numerator is actually two. Because if we were to add these two values here, the four over x plus two squared, plus one, we would actually get a common denominator. So we could write this as y is equal to four over x plus two squared plus, and whenever we get a common denominator, if one is the other value here, that's a whole number, we can just say this is x plus two squared over x plus two squared. We can say it's the denominator divided by itself. And so if we have that, then we have numerators are the same. So this function is really y is equal to x plus two squared plus four, all divided by x plus two squared. And I mean, we can actually go further than this and we can expand out that numerator, the x plus two squared, and then combine like terms. Um, but this will actually show that we do have a squared x or a degree two on the x in the numerator. So that does show that the point is that the horizontal asymptote should be and still is y is equal to one. So let's take a look at an application problem with sunscreen and in particular what SPF means. So the percent, call it S in decimal form of UV rays blocked by your sunblock is a rational function where X, the input is the SPF number. So if we have the SPF number X, the percent of UV rays blocked is given by this function here. So let's find some of these values. We, we have some of these SPF examples here from two to eight to 40. We'll just do a couple of them just to save ourselves on some redundancy. So let's find S of two. So if we're looking at S of two, this is equal to just plug in two for X. So we have two over two plus one. And then this is just equal to two over three, which is approximately 0.67. It's really 0.6 repeating, but we'll just leave it at 0.67. The next one we have is S of, let's do eight. This is equal to plug in eight. We have eight over eight plus one. This is equal to eight over nine, which is approximately, it's actually 0.8 repeating, but we'll just say 0.89. And then we'll skip the 40, jump all the way up to 50. So if we're looking at an SPF, amount or SPF level of 50. This is S of 50 is equal to 50 over 50 plus one. And this is equal to 50 over 51. And then when we evaluate this, this is approximately 0.98. And so if we just keep going greater and greater on the SPF value, you can see what's happening. We're increasing our percent of sun blocked or percent of the UV rays blocked. So as we get larger and larger, we're getting that percentage going up. So then the question is, is what is the horizontal asymptote? Let's talk about this in terms of the equation itself without the context, and then talk about what that means in the context here. So if we have this function x over x plus one, comparing the degrees in the numerator and the denominator, the degree is the same. So that means that the horizontal asymptote is the ratio of the coefficients of the highest degree terms. So we have the highest degree terms are just x to the one, x to the one. So those coefficients are just one and one. So the horizontal asymptote is just y equals one. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals one because those degrees are the same. And so what this means is that as the SPF number increases, so as SPF, which remember is x, increases, the percent of UV rays blocked, it approaches, and remember the percent of UV rays blocked, this is the Y, so that approaches one. 
which one makes sense because it's a percentage. It's 100%. And so it makes sense that you can't go above 100% because if you're going above 100%, that means you're blocking more UV rays than there really are, which doesn't really make sense in the context. So in this context, this horizontal asymptote makes sense that we are blocking 100% of the rays as you know, SPF number approaches infinity. It's never actually going to get to one, but it's just gonna get very close to one. And so what happens to the percentage of SPF increases, that's kind of answered in this part here. It increases, but not only is it increasing, but it's it increases to one or 100%. And so we just have a review or kind of a big summary box of the rational functions. So rational functions are ratios, right? When you have polynomial divided by polynomial. And we have the restrictions on the domain, which is remember is the x value. So restriction on the x values when the denominator is equal to zero. Because the denominator cannot be zero, that's when we have the restrictions. So for example, if we have y is equal to one over x plus five, then this means that x cannot be equal to negative five because we have that restriction on the x. So then we have that vertical asymptote and that vertical asymptote occurs at the zeros of the denominator. So what that means here is that the zero of the denominator is that we would have x is equal to negative five. So that would be the vertical asymptote in this example here. And then a hole in the graph occurs if there is a common factor in the numerator and in the denominator because when we have a common factor, then we can do some canceling out. So for example, if we have the common factor, let's say we have y equals x minus five, well actually let's make this x plus five over x plus five, we have these common factors of x plus five. So these can divide out and say that our function is really y equals one, but we still have a restriction of x is not equal to five, so what that means is that there is a hole at five. And so we also saw that if there is no restriction on the domain, in other words, if the denominator does not have any real zeros, if it has only imaginary zeros, then the function would be continuous, just like that one example that we saw when we were looking at the tables. So an example of this would be like if we had y is equal to one over x squared plus five. If we have one over x squared plus five, this denominator has no real solutions, no real zeros, let's say. So since there's no real zeros, then that means there's no x value that would make that denominator zero. And so remember with the horizontal asymptotes, we're identifying what are the end behaviors or the tail behaviors of the function. So if we have that, the so how we find those end behaviors, those tail behaviors, is we compare the degrees of the numerator and denominator. So to compare those degrees, remember if we have a function a times x to the m plus some other stuff, doesn't matter what the other stuff is, over b times x to the n plus some other stuff, doesn't matter what it is, as long as x to the m and x to the n are the highest degrees of the numerator and denominator, we compare them and say that if n, the degree in the denominator is greater than the degree in the numerator, then that means that we have the horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. And then if they're equal to each other, those degrees, then we have that the horizontal asymptote is the ratio between the coefficients of those highest degree terms. So it'd be y equals a over b. And then lastly, the degree in the denominator is less than the degree in the numerator. Then what we have is that the horizontal asymptote does not exist. And there's actually a bit more to the does not exist. We can create what's called a slant asymptote where they sort of do approach a value, but they more approach a linear function. We won't focus too much on the linear function stuff or the slant asymptotes. We'll just say that the horizontal asymptote does not exist if we have that the degree in the denominator is less than degree in the numerator. And that's the rational functions.